Welcome to our first set of notes in Unit 4 on sensation and perception. We're going to be talking about both of those separately, really, um, with this being kind of the introductory set of notes for us. So let's talk about what each of these terms mean before we move forward. So we have, you know, our brain, right, our internal mind and mental processes. But then there's the external world, which that sounds so simple, like, yeah, duh, but just kind of setting up the conversation is necessary. But how do we construct our representations of the external world, right? So if I'm looking at my computer mouse here, how is this physically as I'm holding it, as I'm looking at it, um, how is that represented in my brain to a point that I can recognize this as a computer mouse? So to represent the world, we have to detect the physical energy or stimulus from our environment and convert it into neural signals and that is sensation. So just simply detecting the physical stimulus, me holding the mouse and seeing the mouse, that is sensation. When we select, organize, and interpret our sensations, that process is perception. So me recognizing this as a computer mouse, calling it a computer mouse, and making that kind of a category or concept is perception. So let's talk about bottom-up processing. I want you to think of your brain and higher order thinking, like interpretation, as the top. So if bottom up processing is what we're talking about, we're talking about more basic things. So it's the analysis of any stimuli that begins with the sense receptors and works up to the level of the brain and mind. So for instance, if the question that you have to process is which of the following is the American flag? you will know that the bottom middle flag is the American flag due to bottom-up processing because you look at each of the flags, you look at their colors, um, you look at the shapes and all of the different things about the flags, and you then process and organize to which one is the American flag. That's bottom-up processing. So top-down processing is information processing guided by higher level mental processes as we construct perceptions drawing on our, and you should underline this, experience and expectations. Top-down processing is completely dependent on experience and expectations. So for instance, you can read this sentence with every third letter missing, right? You can read that sentence right in the middle there, maybe because I read it for you, but the reason you can read it is because of top-down processing. Your expectations and experiences let you fill in the blanks by making inferences on what you sh what should be there. You have experience with letters and words and as a reader. Therefore, you're able to fill in those blanks because of your expectations. Another example is when you're looking at the clouds, the really puffy white clouds during the sunny day, right? Um, you can say, ooh, that cloud looks like a duck or that cloud looks like a semi-truck because you have experience and know what a duck or a truck look like, okay? That's top-down processing. So making sense of complexity, both of these, bottom and top down uh, processing, work together to help us sort out complex images, like this one. Do you see how many faces there are? There's tons. So let's talk about thresholds and how much of a stimulus is required for us to even notice, for our sensory organs to even pick it up. So we have an absolute threshold, which says it is the same, right? So the definition here, which you have to have to know, is the minimum stimulation needed to detect a particular stimulus 50% of the time. So how much light is required? How much sound is required? How much pressure on your skin? How much of a smell or odor is required for you to detect it 50% of the time? However much it is, it meets your absolute threshold, right? So once you hear a sound, once you see a sight or feel something, it has met your threshold because you are sensing it. Then we have the difference threshold. This is similar to the absolute threshold. It's just that the stimulus is already existing. I would write that down. With difference threshold, the stimulus is already existing. So it's the minimum difference between two stimuli required in order for you to detect it 50% of the time. This is also called just noticeable difference or JND, just noticeable difference. So you're, you know, jamming your favorite song in your car, right? And you've got the stereo turned up really loud. 
So difference threshold says how much do you have to turn the music up or down in order to notice the difference. Once you notice the difference, 50% of the time, you've met your difference threshold. Now, Weber's law adds a little bit to J and D, or difference threshold. It says that the size of the difference is proportionate to the intensity of the original stimulus. So if the stimulus intensity is high, then difference required will also be large. So it will take a bigger increase in the stimulus to notice the difference because it's such a big stimulus. So if the stimulus intensity is low, the just noticeable difference will be smaller or it will take less of an increase or decrease to notice the difference. Okay, so for instance, you're listening to your favorite song again in your car and you have the radio on really, really high. The volume is up really high. Weber's law says that you have to turn it down a lot in order to notice a difference. Whereas if you have it very low volume, right, you can hear it, but it's a lower volume, you only have to turn it up a little bit in order to notice the difference. So again, Weber's law just adds proportionality to just noticeable difference. What about our subliminal threshold? Have you ever heard of subliminal messages? This is when stimuli are below one's absolute threshold for conscious awareness. So if you look at this chart here over on the right in this block is the intensity of the stimulus being very low and then this line here being that your absolute threshold is met. So you don't consciously notice any stimulus, but it is still present, therefore could have a subliminal impact on you. So in other words, for most people, those items are not even consciously detected. You don't even notice them. However, it is possible that some will notice the items, even if it's subconsciously. So here are some examples. In the spring or summer of 1990, Pepsi distributed a line of cool cans as part of a promotional campaign, all four of them being shown here. The second neon one can apparently have, or it apparently has an embedded message if you stack two cans together and you will see three letters here on the can, spelling something not very nice that I don't think Pepsi wants to have on their cans. Um, then there's like tags, um, an embedded subliminal message in 2004, French translation um, being a subliminal message about something not very nice, um, we're sorry our president is an idiot, we didn't vote for him, um, uh, that's not very good. Um, you can say that in many political campaigns that there's been subliminal messages. The Democratic Party claimed in one of Bush's campaign ad controversies that um, the Republicans were trying to use subliminal messages to influence the national public. Um, so they asked the FCC to investigate the TV ad and it kind of um, emphasized the word rats and bureaucrats about Democrats, right? The whole rats thing. Um, back masking is when you take a song and you reverse it. You listen to it in reverse and it's said that a lot of those songs have different messages when listened to backwards and could that be subliminal? The same can be said for reverse speech. If you have a recorded speech and then listen to it backwards, there could be subliminal messages there. And then there's all kinds of other like hidden messages in different political speeches. This one is a good example on the cover of The Little Mermaid, um, a subliminal message being a phallic symbol in um, Titan's castle, King Titan's castle on the cover of the, the VHS or DVD. That's not very nice. So the big question being, do subliminal messages really influence our behaviors? Studies have found that subliminal words flashed briefly on a screen might prime a person's later responses, but it's not going to impact a large group's buying habits, which is a good question. Like, are subliminal messages in a commercial going to make me buy things? Um, no, it's not going to make large groups of people do that, but say you're in a movie theater and there's subliminal um, flashes of popcorn on the screen, that might influence you to go get the popcorn if you were already thinking about doing it. It might prime you to you know what, I kind of want some popcorn. I think now I'm gonna go get it because you just saw the sign or saw the subliminal message. 
Signal detection theory is a theory that kind of gives a spin on absolute threshold. Okay, so it gives a spin on absolute threshold. It says, or it predicts, how and when we detect the presence of a faint stimulus, like a signal, amid background noise or other stimulation. How we're able to detect that signal amongst other stimulation. So it assumes that there is no single absolute threshold and that our detection depends on a couple of things. A person's experience, um, and that are they looking, well not that they're looking for it, but that they have experience detecting that item. Expectations, motivation, and then level of fatigue. If you're tired, you're not gonna be as good at it. Let me give you an example of signal detection theory. Let's say that um, you are in a band, okay? And every day after school, you're playing the drums, you are practicing your drum playing. On a daily basis, you never hear your mom come home and say, honey, dinner's ready. You never hear her. Uh, you don't hear the phone ringing, nothing, because the background noise, right? Well, today at 3 p.m. or let's say 4 p.m. after school, you're playing the drums, you are expecting a phone call um, about potentially getting a gig to go play at, right? Getting essentially a job for your band. So you're expecting the phone call, right? You are motivated to pick up that phone call because you want that job, you want that gig for your band. Um, and so you, with both of those things, according to signal detection theory, you are more likely to detect the stimulus because you are motivated and expecting that stimulus. Your absolute threshold will be lower given while you're playing the drums um, because you are expecting and motivated to pick it up. Sensory adaptation. Right now, do you notice that you're wearing clothes? Like, do you feel the pressure of the clothing on you? You probably do now that I've said it. If you're wearing any kind of jewelry, now that I've said it, you're probably consciously like, oh yeah, I do. I feel my watch on my wrist or my earrings in my ears, right? But you don't, you know, let's say you put any of those things on in the morning, you aren't consciously aware of the pressure of those items on your skin throughout the day. That's because of sensory adaptation. It's diminished sensitivity as a consequence of constant stimulation. So if you put a Band-Aid on your arm, after a while you don't sense it. You initially get into the pool and it's freezing cold. After a while you're like, eh, it's not cold. Everybody jump in, it's fine. Okay, so that's sensory adaptation.